The first cameramen were the most ordinary of amateurs. They filmed anything that was interesting from their point of view and tried to carry that interest to the viewers. And the viewers, in their turn, discovering something unknown to them, became completely captivated by this new attraction. At that time, no one dared to label cinema as an art form. Possibly, only the most insightful could foresee a brilliant future for the motion picture. In the meantime, the new art form was gathering strength and experience. At the same time in Russia, another flourishing art form was reaching its zenith. Classical ballet. Unlike the widely accessible cinema, classical ballet in Russia was entertainment only for nobility, and special value was placed on entertainment. Therefore, ballet performances in Russia were on a grand scale, impressive and extraordinarily expensive. The ballet troupes of the Mariinsky and Balshai theaters, each of which numbered up to 250 artists, were subject to the court ministry of His Imperial Majesty. The artistic lord of the imperial ballet, who had for half a century been creating, developing, and perfecting this astonishing world of dance in Russia, was Marius Petipa. Not one of Petipa's spectacles could do without the so-called character dances, which gave a special spirited coloring to the ballet performances. Among their performers were their own stars, who the public considered to be no less than prima ballerinas and leading men. One of these soloists from the Imperial Ballet was Alexander Shiraev. I was personally lucky in the theater. On finishing theatrical college, I managed to learn almost all the male parts of the contemporary repertoire. That's why I rose from the ranks of the corps de ballet so quickly replacing both the classical and character solo dancers. At the age of 24, without leaving the stage, Shiraev began to teach at the theatrical college. On his suggestion, the first separate class in character dance was introduced to the curriculum, for which he began to devise a special method of teaching. Soon, Petiba invited Shiraev to become coach and choreographer for his ballets. Of new significance was a particular professional quality, Shiraev's unique memory, which allowed him to thoroughly and precisely memorize and recollect dance movements. The method I came up with to prepare for ballet performances was this. I made my own puppets out of paper mache. They were about 20 to 25 centimeters high, on which all the parts of the body were supported by soft wire, allowing them to be put in any position, answering to the movements of the human body. I made about 20 of these puppets in my spare time. Using them, I planned all the dances I was faced with performing. Then, I would sketch on paper each of the movements in a definite sequence, so that this series of movements would correspond to the whole dance and under each sketch, I would put a code for the dance. If this sketch record is transferred onto a narrow strip of paper, then having placed the sketches vertically from the top downwards, it is possible to use it on a home cinema projector, which can show all the recorded movements, giving a complete, clear presentation of the dance. The drawings which Shiraev made on those strips were preserved. One of them we recall. It shows the famous buffoon's dance, which Shiraev himself staged and performed at the Mariinsky Theater as part of the first performance of the ballet, The Nutcracker. The buffoon's dance is considered lost and does not exist in contemporary stage practice.
according to the recollections of his contemporaries, Shirayev's performance of this dance was tremendously popular with the audience. Beginning in 1902, Shirayev and his wife, Natalia Matvieva, began to travel around Europe and Russia studying and recording national dances. At the beginning of the 20th century, the central streets of European cities gradually began filling with illusions in which programs of films were shown. But the attraction of the moving image was not only attracting the attention of those viewers who had come simply for entertainment. While attending the illusions, the thought came to Shirayev that while at the time existing only as a show booth spectacle, the cinema could become a unique tool for recording that art so difficult to describe in words and drawings, the art of dance. On one of his journeys around Europe, Shirayev acquired a Biocam Cine Camera. The advertising for this camera proclaimed, photographs anything in motion from a toy terrier to an ocean greyhound, truly a fearful weapon to place in the hands of the already dangerous amateur photographer, says the pessimist. Shirayev carried out his first filming tests in village localities in the Ukraine, where he went with his family every summer. He also tried filming dances. It became clear to Shirayev that the use of cinefilm in everyday theater work could be extraordinarily useful. At the beginning of the new theatrical season of 1904-1905, he appealed to the directorate of the Imperial Theaters with the suggestion of shooting the dances of the most prominent performers free of charge, and was refused. The directorate of the Imperial Theatres considered that the photographs which hung in a special studio attached to their offices were quite sufficient. Having not received support for his ideas, Shirayev decided to continue assimilating his experience in cinematography independently. When Petepa revived his old ballet Mlada about pagan Slavic life, I was given the part of a jester with a very interesting dance. There were movements when during a squat, I had to stretch a leg out on the floor. I wanted to achieve a grand effect, and with Petepa's agreement, I replaced this paw with a great leap into the squat. Until then, nobody else had done such a move. And no wonder, the dance was extremely risky. Petipa usually sat in the first wing on the left side. However, when I performed this dance, he would sit with his back to the stage for fear of seeing me break my leg.
At the beginning of 1905, the directorate of the Imperial Theatres proposed to Shirayev to perform Petipa's old ballet Talisman Anu for Matilda Kshasinskaya instead of an ordinary revival. At this time, Petipa, without having been officially dismissed, hadn't been invited to work in the theater by the directorate for two years. Shirayev categorically refused to take part in this intrigue against Petipa, who he greatly revered and to whom he considered himself indebted in every way. Since the continuation of my choreographic work was dependent on my ongoing work as an artist, the only thing for me to do was to hand in my resignation from the troupe and take final leave of my colleagues in the theater. By now, Shirayev was working abroad practically all the time, in Berlin, Paris, Munich, Monte Carlo, Riga, and Warsaw. In London, he opened a school, nearly all of whose graduates subsequently formed Anna Pavlova's troupe. Shirayev only returned to Russia in the summer. He spent his holiday time in a highly original way. Cinema had come to occupy almost all of the free time of Shirayev and his family and friends. Shooting with the cine camera had turned into an enthralling pastime, giving great enjoyment to everybody. The dance of the little corsair from the ballet, The Corsair. Character dancers loved to perform this, but also prima ballerinas who didn't disdain to appear on the imperial stage in this small, unpretentious, but rather likable dance number. of dances which Shirayev made remain to the present day the only documented evidence of the character dances in Petipa's ballets and how they were performed. <laughs> 